All right. Welcome. Lynn, I'll let you take it over. Okay. Well, um, yes. Welcome to um, Coffee Without Colleen. <laughs> Don't touch your dials. This is Coffee with Colleen, but um, Colleen is on a well-deserved vacation for a couple of weeks. And so um, my EDC colleague, Peggy Simmons and I are, um, we got the keys to the Coffee with Colleen car. And um, so uh, we are looking forward to welcoming uh, two guests from Peninsula Behavioral Health, the CEO, Wendy Sisk, and the Development okay. Director, yes. did I say that? Did, is that the correct title? Great, Rebecca Miller, welcome. And um, we're looking forward to learning absolutely everything about PBH, every nook and cranny. People on, on the um, Zoom call, please feel free to type your questions into the chat or raise a, an electronic hand and we'll acknowledge that. And um, I know that, wow, with, a, with an organization as complex as PBH, I suspect our conversations will be all over the map. So without further ado, I wonder, this is a little bit off, um, not off topic, but I, I would love to hear from both of you a little bit about what brought you to where you are today in your, in your profession, at your place in PBH. Um, what, tell us a little bit about your professional trajectory. Why are you here? Rebecca, why don't we start with you? Oh gosh, thanks so much. Well, you know, nobody, it's funny, nobody ever goes to college to become um, somebody in development. It's, it's strange, but um, I, um, when I was in my late 20s, 30s, I worked at Franklin Templeton, which is, you know, Fortune 500 company. So I had a finance, finance background and down, this is down in the Bay Area. And um, then I'm, moved when my dad retired and and we started coming back home to Washington State where I was born. Um, I actually was um, selling long-term care insurance and annuities for a time in Vancouver and Portland. And then I, I don't know how I got into it, but I started working as a vocational rehab counselor and got recruited to work up in the Port Angeles office. And I thought I had like, oh my God, I get this dreamy world of living in a small town. And, um, but it was whenever our last, you know, economic downturn was, and I was last in, first out. And so meanwhile, one of our now, well, former board members, Jen Gouch had gotten me on the board at Vimo. And so I always blame Jen for, for entering me into the world of nonprofits in Clallam County. And, um, I am just so thrilled that that's, that was really what got me landed there. So I met Peter Casey, our former executive director here, and we were at a meeting one day and he said, hey, what do you do? And he said, would you be at all interested in starting a development office for PBH? And I was like, well, I don't have to think about that question. And um, so that was nine years ago this July. So wow. I've been here for nine years. And loving it. And I, um, you know, with, and then I'll, Wendy has a much more direct route. <laughs> well, Thank mostly you. geographically. So I'm, I'm an Eastern Washington kid. I got my degrees at Central Washington University. I knew I wanted to be a therapist when I grew up. So um, that's, I got my degree and then I moved to the Seattle area and did my graduate internship and worked for a private for profit psychiatric hospital for a couple of years. And that drove me right out of the behavioral health field. Um, I left that job and I went to work for US West is now Quest. This is Wendy, how may I provide you excellent customer service today? Um, after about nine months of that, I found my way into community behavioral health um, in Seattle. Come about a year later, my neighbor shot and killed another neighbor and his girlfriend. And we realized, you know, working in community behavioral health, we're never gonna make, be able to make a decent living and live in Seattle in a safe and comfortable area. And so we, we made a decision, we were gonna leave Seattle in 
towards the uh, fall of 2002. And I, we started looking and we decided we were going to either go to Austin, Texas, because it was an up and coming town and my husband was doing some tech stuff at the time or um, move to Squint. So, you know, <laughs> So we made the obvious choice as a young couple and we moved to SQUIM in um, November of 2002 and I was hired at PBH as a case manager at that time. Um, after about a year and a half in that department, I spent about a decade in crisis services, a large chunk of that um, as the supervisor of crisis services and supervisor of community support services. I became clinical director in 2014. And I thought that was the job I was going to stay in for the rest of my life. It was great. I'm really good at all this legal stuff, all this Washington um, legal language stuff, um, helping people implement things. I'm, I'm really an analytic person. I'm really, really good with numbers, um, which is weird for people in mental health. It's not usually our thing. It's more people than numbers. And so when my predecessor, Peter Casey, decided to retire in 2016, he said to me, um, at the beginning of that year, you need to apply for my job. And I said, you're insane. <laughs> Why would I want that job? I could never do that job. I don't have the skills for that job. So, um, so the board of directors disagreed and they hired me. And um, <laughs> we, we do have a volunteer board. And it was chaired at that time by Roger Oaks, who many of you know. And so, you know, I became CEO in 2016. And we had a staff about, of about 85 and we are now a staff of about 150. And really, if, if we could fill all of our positions, we have about 160 FTEs at Peninsula Behavioral Health today. So I must be doing something right. I'm not sure. I have a really great team around me. Um, one of the really fantastic things I've learned about you know, being in that top seat is I don't have to know it all. I just have to have the right people to support the work that we wanna do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a share screen here and see if I can't bring up my, did that work? Can Ooh, you beautiful. see my slideshow? Okay, because yeah. that's not what I'm seeing, so that's fun. Okay, <laughs> so uh, you never know with Zoom, right? You just that's never right. know what you're gonna see on the screen. So um, PDH was established in 1971. So it was established before I was established by a local community physician um, that a lot of people thought he was a psychiatrist, he was not, but Norm Peterson just saw a big gap in our community. And since that time, we've really you know, changed a lot. One of the things that's changed over time is our mission. And our mission at this point is really to provide quality, comprehensive community behavioral health services to residents of this community. And behavioral health typically encompasses mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm a numbers person. We serve about 3,100 community members a year. So that's about one in 20 residents of this end of the county. So we have probably seen some of your neighbors and your friends and your family members, whether you know it or not. Like I said, we have about 150 staff. Um, our budget is hanging out around somewhere around the $14 million. The vast majority of those funds are coming from out of our area. So the vast majority of those funds are Medicaid dollars. So that's a combination of state dollars and federal dollars that are coming into our community. And on any given year, we put 75 to 85% of that directly into staff salaries and benefits. So that's money that's going into our community, staying into our community. Our staff have living wage jobs and they're going out into the great wide world and supporting your businesses. Um, we have a lot of real estate, actually. It's, it's kind of funny for being a nonprofit. So we are the second largest nonprofit in Clallam County, second only to Olympic Medical Center. Now they have a couple more staff than we do by a, by a factor <laughs> of about 10, you might have noticed. Um, OMC is up to about 1600 staff now. But, um, you know, second only to OMC in, in terms of the footprint of a not-for-profit. But we have offices in Squim, and we have our Front Street office, which is just psychotherapy in Port Angeles. And then we have our main office uh, in PA, uh, yeah, which is about a 26 
thousand square foot facility. Okay. So if you've never had an opportunity to come visit us, please reach out to Rebecca because she'd love to take you on a tour. Um, you know, whether it was Eric Lewis from the hospital or Mike Maxwell, who runs the North Olympic Healthcare Network, every time we bring community members into our office, they say to us, we had no idea. We had no idea how big you guys were. We had no idea how many people it takes to support the, the wellness of our community. Mm -hmm. um, we are governed by a volunteer board of directors and we're really, really lucky right now to have an amazing group. Uh, most of them have either personal lived experience or family members who have lived experience with mental health or substance use disorders, but we have a nice variety. So Russ, our board president, is um, a pastor at Dungeness Valley Lutheran Church in Squim. Um, Deb Reed is a retired software engineer. Uh, Marianne Udy is a retired physician. Dave Arand is a detective with Port Angeles Police Department. Patrick Erker does um, does elder law and guardianships and things like that. And Vicki Lowe is from the Jamestown Squallum tribe and Dr. Christian, also another retired physician, grants in the timber industry. And March Picker comes from a family military background and has a family member who accesses care with us. So we have a really nice diverse group of people, which is fantastic because again, that increases the depth of my field of people we can call on for help as we go into some of the changes we've had and, and some of the exciting expansion that PBH has going on. So what do we do here? Um, I'm gonna to try to keep this short, but the list goes on and on and on. So I think when people think of Peninsula Behavioral Health, what I hear in the community is, oh, they serve the indigent population. Yes, we do that. We provide counseling, we provide case management, we provide all sorts of services to a low income population. We also serve doctors and nurses and lawyers and other people in the community who have complex behavioral health needs. Not everyone can just, you know, go to their primary care doctor and get a script from them for some antidepressant and then be okay. Some people need a more comprehensive scope of care than that. And we're really the only place in town that has a full breadth of care for both mental health and substance use treatment. We offer psychiatric rehabilitation services, things like helping people with serious mental illness get back into the workforce. Um, we are, offer substance use treatment services, and we really approach that from a harm reduction model. We meet people where they're at, and you, know, you can be in treatment and get help even as, as you're struggling with relapse and things like that, which is different from the old model of substance use treatment, where if you relapse, you don't really want help, so we're kicking you out. We've added some primary care services for our clients who can't or won't access primary care in the community. So that's been really exciting. Um, we have residential services. We own three houses and one 19 bed assisted living so that some of those folks with the most serious and persistent mental illness have a place to lay their heads. We have currently four and we're hiring for a fifth homeless outreach staff. I know there's a lot of talk about homeless outreach in the community and we partner with the rediscovery program, um, but you might not know that PBH has actually been doing that service for many, many years and we continue to expand um, those services. And those are largely federally funded grant programs that allow us to have people out there just trying to find people who need help and support, getting them linked in, getting them linked in with housing services. Last year, we did house five homeless individuals from our community and in the current housing market you may know what a miracle that is so um, we also provide 24-hour crisis intervention and stabilization services that means if somebody calls the suicide hotline after hours and they really need to be seen face to face that suicide hotline calls pbh and says you know Tom's not doing well. Do you feel like you can go out to the home? Do you feel like you could meet them somewhere? How do you want to see this person? But they really got to be seen. So our staff are working 24 hours a day. We have a presence in the hospital. We have a presence in the jail and juvenile detention. Um, when there's something urgent that comes up and there's not somebody else to deal with it, PBH is there. We have some really intensive wraparound services for youth. Um, that are really unique to Washington State. It's a program funded by the state called Wraparound with Intensive Services. And um, that really allows us to provide a lot of care, not just to a child in need, but their family system as well. Because one of the things that we've found with kids services in particular 
is families often want us to just fix the kid, but it's pretty hard to fix a kid when there's a lot of dysfunction going on around them. So, you know, we're really trying to provide whole person support to kids in our community as well. And I don't know if you guys heard about this whole COVID business that happened <laughs> last year. So um, 2020 was an interesting year for us. There was a big shift in Medicaid. And, you know, basically the state privatized Medicaid for healthcare. So we brought in a bunch of managed care companies and it totally changed how everybody in healthcare was paid. And, you know, PBH rolled through that pretty, pretty well with less difficulties, I think, than a lot of our partners, including on the, both on the primary care side and the substance use side. Um, and then a couple months later, there was this amazing grant opportunity that popped up and we, you know, we pulled it together. Rebecca's like, I think we can do this. And in a few short weeks, we pulled together this grant application for this grant for to become a CCBHC, a Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. And it's really applying kind of the federally qualified health center model of care into community behavioral health. So it's providing some extra funding and structure to expand services. It allowed us to add intensive case management, supported employment services, supported housing services, increased therapy services. Um, Spravato, which is a treatment for people who have treatment resistant depression that's been showing incredible results. So it, it really allowed us to do a lot of really creative things. And it was really fun to launch giant new programs and do a whole bunch of staff recruiting in the middle of a pandemic. And so at the same time, all of a sudden, there was a lot of question about what do we do? You know, do we close our office? Are we going to be considered essential? And I just want to say PBH has never closed our office. We reduced some hours. We did temporarily close our squim office and did telehealth only out of squim office. We pivoted to telehealth in about a week and a half. So it was in our plan to do it eventually in our three-year plan, but we decided we kind of had to do it and we had to do it now. But a lot of the people we serve don't have good broadband access. They don't have enough minutes on their cell phone. And so we had to keep our doors open. So PBH never closed our doors, even through the entire pandemic. And guess how many COVID cases we had among staff? We had no COVID cases amongst our 150 staff. So our staff really worked the program. They masked, they used protocols. We figured out how to buy PPE that we'd never had to have before. We worked with the county, with the, um, with the emergency operations center to make sure our staff had what we need. We worked with the ER to make sure when our crisis staff were going into the emergency department that they were properly protected as we rolled through this pandemic. And, you know, it's just, it's been a really wild time around here. The last year and a half, PBH has just shifted tremendously. And we continue to try to figure out, you know, so where do we go from the here? What of this stays? Telehealth, ladies and gentlemen, is here to stay, whether it's at PBH or other healthcare clinics. It's never going to be the primary way we provide care because rumor has it we've learned that people are important and human <laughs> contact is really important. Um, you know, we, we've really tried to make sure people know that our services are for everybody. We, we don't turn people away for the inability to care. I have a great federal grant right now that allows me to um, offer to ask people invasive questions that they can just decline answering. But regardless of income, if you have a high deductible health plan and you can't access care because you can't meet your deductible, we'll bill your insurance, get that denial and be able to build a federal program. So, and that goes through next July, which is really fantastic. Um, and we see people from all walks of life. We have a veterans program. We see people with depression and anxiety. It's a lot of what we're seeing now. You know, we really anticipated with the pandemic that we were gonna see a lot of depression. And what we really saw was huge, huge increases in the number of people re reporting symptoms of anxiety, nervousness, I can't sleep, I'm worried about stuff all the time. And what we're seeing now is, you know, a trajectory where we saw a real dip in people coming in and accessing care in April and um, March and April and May of last year. But last year, we actually provided more services than any year prior, despite the fact that we had three months where we provided almost no service. And that upward trend continues. Right now, we're, we had in May 135 new people request care from us in our community. 
and 95 of those actually entered service. And so we're really trying to keep up with that demand for our community. There are a lot of people out there, I think, who've just been really struggling and didn't know where to go to get help. And even if we're not the right place, we're really great at guiding people to where they need to end up. So why are we important to you guys as employers? <laughs> so I'm talking to the EDC. I know this is important. Um, one in five people in the United States lives with a mental illness. That's a, that's a large portion of our population. Not all of those people are disabled. Most of them aren't. Most of them are living their lives. But when their anxiety or their depression or their other mental health issues are, are untreated, they're not as productive as they normally would be. They tend to have attendance issues. They may you know, have interpersonal conflict with others because their distress level is up so high. And we know that you know, people with mental health and substance use disorders also consume a great deal of healthcare and that drives up your healthcare premiums for you and your staff. So by treating people's mental health concerns, we make them better employees, we make them better neighbors, we make them better community members, we make them feel better. That, you know, is really our driving force, but we know that there's these ripple effects out in the community that actually have a significant impact for folks. So over the last year, you know, these are just a couple of slides um, pulled from the Washington State has been, Department of Health has been producing some behavioral health impact reports. And if you take a look, at the first graph, that's really the graph of psychological distress. So if you look at what was happening at the beginning of this year, can, compared to what was happening at the beginning of the previous two years, so the current year is in black, um, 2019 is in orange, and um, 2020 was in blue. So we didn't see people showing up at the emergency department early last year it took a while for that distress to ramp up, but we're already up there in the upper levels of what we normally see. Um, the second graph is Washington State created a listening line for people just to call and talk about their COVID distress. And I think that a lot of people thought we were kind of over that and people, people have just adapted. And um, that's not at all what we're seeing. We're seeing that those number, the number of people continuing to access that line is still high. And I think part of the reason for that is that early on in the pandemic, we demonstrated that we have a lot of resilience, right? So we thought, oh my gosh, this is a huge crisis. People are gonna come out of the woodworks. Well, they didn't, they hunkered down, they used their skills, they you know, took care of each other. But I think you know, we're, we're looking at some pandemic fatigue at this point. And I, I joke occasionally that, you know, the, that COVID is over at the end of the month because oh, Washington's reopening. It's not actually true at all. I looked at the county website yesterday. There's only about 32 cases in our county right now, but six of those people are in the hospital. So we're not through this yet. Um, but it's, there will continue to be impact from that. So, you know, and what is our impact as an, as an organization on the community? So we have about 150 staff. And really, again, if I had everything full, more like 160, about 55 of those jobs require a high school education or a, you know, year or less certificate. About 45 of those jobs require you have an AA, a BA, or an RN. About 50 of those jobs are master's level clinicians, um, medication prescribers, psychotherapists, those sorts of things. And then we have a couple, um, one PhD on staff and one Actually, she's a DO, she's not an MD, but one physician on staff. So, you know, again, the majority of our revenue comes from outside the, outside the county and the area. And we're constantly, constantly seeking additional revenue to, to support the work and continue to expand what we're doing. Um, I wanted to share again, because of the, the cohort I'm talking with today, a little bit about supported employment. So this is a new service for us. This is something the state put together um, as part of a big package of services that they sold to the federal government. Hey, we're going to do all this great new stuff. So we've actually got a supported employment program that right now it has one FTE, but it's really looking like we're, we're probably going to have to add a second person because we have so many people who are looking for work right now and so many people who really need just a little bit extra support. So 
Um, we have an evidence-based program that allows us to help participants with resumes, interview skills, job coaching, job shadowing, um, intervention. If one of these folks, if we've helped place one of these folks in your business and they're struggling a little bit, our employment specialist can come in and provide some additional support, which is pretty cool. It's really participant built, uh, driven and we're really about trying to help businesses fill vacant positions. And so, you know, if there are business owners out there who would be interested in entertaining, um, working with our employment specialist, Harrison Pierce, if you just called PBH and asked about um, employment, supported employment, they refer you to Harrison Pierce. Um, and he could help you. There's also some tax credits that are available to help employers who are willing to employ people who've had disabilities. So there's some incentives out there, but that's been a really successful program. And, you know, we're really just trying to match um, people who have, you know, often have a work history, get back into the workforce after having, you know, a difficult spell. And I know that businesses are really hurting right now to, to, um, do some of those entry-level positions. I mentioned earlier that PBH does have, does have some housing. Um, this is a picture of Arlene Engel home over on 2nd and Oak. And we live in a very wonderful neighborhood over there of, you know, there's an Airbnb next door and we don't get a whole lot of the NIMBY complaints in this neighborhood. Of, we don't want your people here. Instead, we get the complaint of, oh, Rebecca, I heard Rebecca coughing outside. Have you made sure she's called her doctor? Are the kinds of how, uh, neighborhood calls that we get. Um, Arlen Engel Home was built sometime around the turn of the century and it became PBH's housing in about 1985. So we've been in that neighborhood for a long time. We're going to be doing some, hopefully doing some renovation to that facility this year, because if any of you own a, one of those homes that was built around the turn of the century, there's things that need to be taken care of periodically. So we also have three supported living houses, um, and we are always looking at how can we expand housing. And I maybe I saw that Commissioner Johnson was on here. I maybe sent out a fishing expedition with Commissioner Johnson this last week about, boy, do I have an idea, but it's not ready for prime time yet. But I do, you know, we're always looking for ways to be able to house um, folks with serious and persistent mental illness because they're they are harder to house. If you have two candidates and one of them's, you know, one of my staff people, and the other one is somebody who looks a little odd because they have a serious and persistent mental illness, you're probably going to choose to rent to the person who's maybe dressed more like me and has their hair groomed like I do than to maybe somebody who's been living on the streets for a long time and those sorts of things. So, you know, for us to be able to provide some transitional housing to folks to be able to then help them get into the housing market is really, really beneficial. Um, the issue for us is we don't actually typically have the capital resources to make those investments. So at least one of the houses that we own and operate was actually gifted to PBH. So if anybody has any housing you'd like to, you know, gift, we're happy to take that on. And we continue to dream about expanding that housing. Um, just a couple other things. There's, there's a lot of talk right now about money flowing into, and I'm going to, I'm going to turn off my slide, slideshow here if I can figure out how to do that. Can you help me with that, Lynn or Peggy? Yeah, just can you just stop oh, there the screen? Yeah, yep, there it is. It appeared. I couldn't right. make it appear for a moment there. Um, so one of the things that's going on right now in behavioral health is there's a lot of talk about how much money has been legislated for behavioral health this year. And I know our, our um, legislators have been, and, and I just want to make sure that our community understands the vast majority of that is not going to land in our community. So there's there's a lot of resources out there. We are we are definitely seeing a couple percent increase. The the day that we heard what the final legislative increase for behavioral health was, which was two percent this year, um, we also heard that the cost of living went up about four percent. We have a serious workforce shortage, particularly in our skilled master's level clinicians. That, that makes it very makes it very. Oh, I'm getting feedback from Sherry. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's been, it's been very interesting. So we're trying to figure out how do we, 
you know, continue to grow the kind of care that we need when we have a serious workforce shortage. And we did some really great stuff in our, in our state in the last few years where we've expanded behavioral health care outside of just the community mental health center. And we're trying to get upstream and capture people before they need that complex level of care that we provide. And we did that by adding clinicians into primary health care settings, into hospitals, those sorts of things, which was great, except for we had a workforce shortage. And so then that's really exacerbated that. So we saw about a 15% increase in the behavioral health reimbursement rate in the primary care clinic and a 2% increase in the community behavioral health system. I, I see that, Lovelyn. <laughs> Can you, We're used to it. It's a thing that happens. Can you flesh, I mean, can you just restate that? <laughs> For people that may not have, I mean, it's that to me, when I heard that last week, I was gobsmacked. Hmm. So, so again, there's, there was a 15% increase in the reimbursement rate in the primary care setting for behavioral health and a 2% in the community system. So, you know, that's, that's not atypical for us to see um, the community system. And, and there's some other targeted investments. There's about $30 million in COVID funds that are coming out to behavioral health. Um, I don't know if PBH will see that. We actually did pretty well during the pandemic from a, from a financial standpoint because we did get some support from the county and we were able to get a paycheck protection loan. Um, again, I don't know that that will flow out. And then we've also funded some really, really great programs and teams, which is going to increase the number of staff needed to um, implement those teams. So strategically, you know, the state was trying to create some youth mobile crisis outreach teams and some clubhouse models and some other things. But again, that requires more humans to fill those roles. And there's already not enough humans to fill those roles. So, and those programs are likely going to end up in the I-5 corridor. Those sorts of, you know, when you see individually funded programs, they often end up in the I-5 corridor, unless it's something we've asked for, for specifically. Right now, there's some great behavioral health facilities grant money out there. It's all for crisis stabilization, which is actually a program we already have in our community. So we're not going to be able to access that. So, so there were some great investments in behavioral health. Um, this last legislative session, but I don't know that we're going to see a whole lot of that here. I think, you know, from a workforce standpoint, PBH is struggling to get folks out here. And when we do get them out here, you know, where are people going to live? And we, we've all talked about this ad nauseum, but, you know, we're, we're feeling that pinch. I think OMC has either bought or is, or is leasing some housing for staff. Um, now because they want to give people enough time to find a place to live and you know we're really not in a position to be able to do something like that that doesn't our our money when we get money is typically earmarked if this is what you can use it for with the exception of our private insurance and medicare revenues which go to offset the losses of other programs that are important to support in the community so um you know it, it makes it really tricky to bring folks out here and then have them not be able to find housing. So we're in that with everybody else. Um, the other challenge for us often is the trailing spouse. You know, we, we hire somebody who's a high skill level individual and they have a high skill level individual spouse who has a really specific skill set. Um, we hired somebody a couple years ago whose husband did nuclear medicine. Well, there's like two nuclear medicine jobs on the peninsula and they were full at that time. They're back, it's fantastic, but they left the area because the spouse couldn't find work in, in his field. So, you know, we're really, you know, we're really feeling the pinch of a lot of the same things that other businesses are. Um, we're really seeing our community reaching out to us for more help than we've ever seen before. We're trying to meet that need. Um, we're looking at our squim office and I saw Sherry Crane was on here and, you know, we're looking at our squim office and we know that we need to have a bigger footprint in squim. And we're trying to figure out from a, from a fiscal standpoint, how do we make that happen? How do we find a bigger office space? Because right now we just don't have enough space to accommodate a full-time team, but we have a large number of people in squim um, who really need that support. And it's unfair that they have to drive to PA and back. Um, we also, you know, we're not just looking at this end of the county. The whole county is important to us. We partner closely with West End Outreach Services, the treatment provider out in Forks. And it's my job in community meetings to make sure that West End Outreach doesn't get forgotten. Um, you know, we're looking at some other 
countywide initiatives. I'm working really closely with Mark Nichols and um, Judge Dave Newport on developing an actual statutory behavioral health court. And we'll be pitching that to the county commissioners sometime later this year and are really garnering support that, you know, sometimes people need additional treatment supports and resources to be successful and not necessarily jail time, particularly when they're engaging in, you know, minor criminal activity that's really driven by mental illness versus by intent to do harm. So, you know, we've got a lot of initiatives and projects going on. Rebecca, what, what did I miss? There's so much. I mean, I could go on. I told Lynn, we could go on for three or four hours about, about what's going on over here, but there's, there's always so much. There is. And I know that I'll think of something in a minute, but then I noticed that there's a question in the chat room. So, so I'll pitch to that. <laughs> yeah. Carol from PDRC, would you like to ask your question? And Carol, if you are talking, you're muted. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hello. I'm so delighted to be here. This is so helpful. And I uh, was actually just recently contacted by a landlord in a RV park. And he said he has a tenant that he believes is off his medication. He is uh, doing unsafe things like leaving the water on, flooding the unit. He is being highly disruptive. Other tenants uh, threatening to uh, move. And so the tenant is, or I'm sorry, the landlord says he does not want to evict. He wants to you know, get help for the tenant. And I'm wondering if a landlord can call PBH to get assistance with a tenant. Absolutely. It's a great question, Carol. And absolutely. So what would typically happen in that sort of situation is we look to try to find out if this, some, if this is somebody that we know that's maybe, you know, engaged in services that has fallen off. And then we would send those staff out to do some intervention and assess the safety of the situation. If not, we would look at sending our crisis staff out. Um, about 50% of the people that our crisis staff come in contact with have never been seen by PBH before. So, and our, our crisis staff are currently seeing about 400 community members a month. So, yeah. So um, it's, you know, can we do something becomes another issue, right? So Washington state is a very permissive patient rights state and our services are largely voluntary. And the only time we can make people access care is when we can prove that they absolutely can't take care of their basic health and safety needs. They're an imminent danger to themselves or they're an imminent danger to others or property. So that becomes, and that's a legal standard. That's a legal determination that we have to make and then we have to petition the court. So that doesn't happen a lot. We probably do about 200 involuntary um, admits a year where we're actually suspending somebody's civil rights and we're saying, nope, you don't get to choose. This is the treatment that you're getting. But Washington state really protects patient rights. But it doesn't mean that we can't use motivational interviewing techniques, that we can't use clinical skills to try to help guide people even when they don't want care in that direction. So that's it, what our homeless outreach folks are out there doing. Lots of people you know, know they might need help, but for whatever reason, the system's scary. They don't want help. You know, Our staff are there again and again and again and again until such a time as somebody's really ready to accept that, that assistance. And, you know, I spent about a decade in crisis services. And one of the things I loved about it was that you get people at that moment where something's got to give. So you're a guy in the trailer, something's got to give. And there's opportunities to make different choices there. People don't always take that. People don't always, you know, it could end up in, in an eviction down the road, or it could end up in somebody making some some choices, but our staff are really skilled at trying to engage people. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to help people find their way to, to the care that they need. And, and sometimes it's not even us, right? Sometimes it's, you know, really about getting some basic needs met. I don't have enough food and then I get angry and then I can't, you know, control my behavior. And, you know, that's a really simple thing to solve. Our partners at the food bank this year, holy cow, have they done an amazing job pushing food out of our food banks. 
um, you know, we've really, as a community, I think had to rally together in some unique ways over the last 16 months that we haven't had to do before. And I think that, you know, some good will come of that over the long run, but those are, those are the hardest ones because people have a right to make bad choices in our state, whether they have mental health issues or not. You all know people who make bad choices in your lives, right? Thank you so much. And Rebecca, I will definitely be calling for a tour. I love it. That'd be great. And, and, and I will make a shameless plug um, because, you know, when development means we're, you know, always looking for money and such, I am super excited to say that we've got, we're actually going to hold our event this year. So um, save the date. And I want to introduce Chase Whale. Um, he's our new development specialist. Um, hi, Chase. Hi. And, um, we, he, we brought him out from Texas and um, he actually found housing, but I will tell you, it was so stressful, even for me, until we knew that he found a, a place to live. So super happy about that. Right now, he is working on Save the Date cards. So October 1st, out at Seven Cedars. Um, our speaker is Stephanie Land. She wrote a book called Made, that's M-A-I-D. And it's actually a local story. Um, she, one of the poignant stories she tells in her book is that her daughter learned how to walk in a homeless shelter. And um, this was happening right on the peninsula, Port Townsend and Port Angeles make it in the book. And although it was, um, pr production was shut down, Netflix is going to soon be releasing a limited series on the, based on the book. So um, you can come to our event first and, and then watch, watch the series unfold on Netflix. So we will, um, we're really excited about that. We really do depend on private donations for that wiggle room because uh, it's, we're never gonna turn anybody away for ability to pay, but it's not only services. And so, as Wendy was saying, so much of our money is earmarked just for services. And um, we are helping people in all sorts of just, just random ways. Wendy, yesterday it was, you know, handlebars for a bicycle so that they could get to a job interview or that kind of thing. So we really appreciate that uh, public support as well because it, it goes right directly into the hands of our clients. Oh, and somebody wanted me to repeat the date of the event. Let me do that. It's October 1st, so 10-1-21. And we'll be hosting that at Seven Cedars. Um, the Jamestown Squam Tribe has been such a wonderful partner with that um, event over the last few years. So we're excited to be taking it back out there again. Great. Whoa, exciting. Are there other questions about behavioral health or the state of affairs out there from our perspective or other things that I can share? I have a question, maybe an, an opinion, um, you know, with the, with the crossover between law enforcement and having your outreach, have you noticed as far as, I don't know if you can answer this or not, the funding, um, it's a lot of money for, for a law enforcement to keep going out to help somebody, uh, and it's not necessarily their position to be out there doing that when they can be doing other things. Um, have you seen a positive offset from that? Or maybe Sherry Crane can speak to that too. Yeah, that might be a better, a better question for Sherry. I do know part of what we're trying to do is get people before law enforcement has to take them into the emergency department. So in the old days, if you were in, in an acute mental health emergency and you called 911, the response was, we're going to take you to the ER. You're going to be there for three to five hours while OMC does a whole bunch of medical clearance. And then Peninsula Behavioral Health will eventually come out and probably then put together a disposition and you'll go home. So we're really doing the vast majority of our care. So in an average month, again, we're doing about 400 crisis interventions with our crisis staff. And under 50 of those are happening in the ED now. In the old days, that number was much higher. So I want to say last month, there were like 35 contacts in the emergency department. So we are trying to 
respond in the community more. We've also gotten to a situation where some during business hours, sometimes law enforcement, you know, if it's safe, we'll bring people here. If they're, you know, trying to, you know, tear somebody's face off or be aggressive or assaultive, you know, we don't have the skills and the safety to maintain them in our office, but those are really rare cases. In most cases, you know, um, law enforcement are being called out because of odd behavior. And sometimes that's a call of, hey, can you guys follow up with this person within the next 24 hours? We have a mechanism for that now. Sometimes it's, hey, can you come out in the field with us? Um, but we've actually, you know, for a long time, we've had four staff in crisis services and we have to cover 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So, you know, we've been really lean on that crisis staffing. And recently we've been able to increase that. So we have more staff so that we're more readily able to respond out in the community. So we now have six full-time designated crisis responders and two full-time crisis case managers. And then we're adding a peer position to our crisis service to help with people who coordinate with people who are in psychiatric hospitals across the state. So we're really, again, we're trying to get away from that model. Um, and the state's moving towards a 988 number. Na national -wide, nationwide, we're going to implement 988 in the next couple of years, which will take you directly into the crisis system. So somebody having a mental health emergency, instead of calling 911, will be encouraged to call 988. And then if there's a face-to-face -face contact needed, then that will be dispatched out to our crisis staff. So there's a lot of planning going on. The state got a small amount of money from the federal government or on planning. And, you know, it's really complicated. I think it's probably going to be a few years before that's really fully fleshed out because the existing crisis system in every state is totally different. And they've got to create some sort of unity to be able to roll out that nationwide contact number. So we are working in that direction to try to take some of that off of law enforcement's plate and being able to respond you know, in the field, squims a little harder for us, right? So Sherry and I are actually going to be getting together next week to talk a little bit about, you know, how are things going in SQUIM and, and you know, make sure that we're all on the same page. But, you know, and we're also, like I said, trying to look at how do we more robustly staff the SQUIM into the county. Hi, this is Colleen Robinson. And um, I have more of a comment than a question. Good morning, Wendy and Rebecca. Go build some housing. Go build some housing. <laughs> yes, I'm building some houses. Um, I just wanted to say my husband and I were foster parents um, for many years here in Clallam County um, and ultimately foster adopted three children. And um, Peninsula Behavioral Health was a cr critical um, supportive partner in helping us raise those children. Um, we access services in Port Angeles, we access them in SQUIM, um, and I'm not sure where we would have been. Um, so more of a testimonial to thank you for what you do. I am so incredibly proud of how you have grown this organization. Um, Wendy and Rebecca and all that you do for the community is just amazing. And as I said, from SQUIM family, Robinson, thank you very much for your support. Thanks, Colleen. See you at West Coffee with Colleen, you guys. Great. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. <laughs> Takes three of us. <laughs> Could you say a little bit more about your programming for kids? Because I know you you recent well, not too recently, but recently um, opened a whole new wing and building. We did. So, you know, we renovated the old St. Vincent de Paul. So if you guys drove down 8th Street a decade ago, it looks very different today. Between our, our partner, Jack Heckman, across the street, who revitalized the car wash and, you know, took care of some derelict buildings in our neighborhood to the renovation of St. Vincent de Paul, you know, our neighborhood's just so different today than it was a few years ago. Um, you know, we serve typically, Rebecca, like about seven to 900 kids every year at PBH. And, you know, what, what's particularly sad is the amount of trauma that we see with these kids. And, and sometimes we have a child and a parent and a grandparent all in care at one time, which is something really wonderful about that and something really saddening about that at the same time. Um, you know, our children's services had been in our large main office for a long time, which is not the most kid-friendly space. It's, it's big and it's chaotic and, you know, there's hundreds of, of people in and out of this building every single day. So, 
Yeah, we renovated the St. Vincent de Paul building. First phase was to build our crisis stabilization program, which we completed in 2014. And then I think probably 2016, 17, we did the renovation of the children's building. And maybe a little bit later, it all starts running together. But, um, you know, we converted that 4,000 square foot space into office space. So there's really kid dedicated therapy space and playroom. Um, and then our, our WISE team, which got really big really fast is our wraparound with intensive services team. We have youth peer partners and we have parent peer partners and we have care coordinators and we have therapists who are all in a team together working to support a limited number of families. And what the, the idea behind that program is really two years of an, up to two years of intensive care to really get those families who are involved in a lot of systems. Maybe they're involved in juvenile justice or maybe CPS is involved or, you know, maybe, you know, they're struggling. There's a parent struggling with substance use and really wrapping around the intensive treatment team around those families and helping them figure out who are their natural supports. Who are the people in the community who are going to take care of that family when behavioral health is no longer in their lives? Because the reality is most people don't come to PBH forever. There's some folks, there's probably a couple hundred people out of the 3000 people we see a year that are really going to be with us for a long period of time. Most people pass through. And, and part of what we try to do with kids and families is figure out who are the people in your life that you can count on that aren't us. You know, is it a pastor from your church? Is it the counselor at school? Is it, you know, Aunt Patty, the neighbor who's not really related to you, who lives two blocks down the road, but always has cookies? You know, who are those people in, in that child and family's lives that will always be there to support them, or at least for a good chunk of, of the next few years? So we're really trying to help people build the skills that they can go out and that they don't need us. Our goal is always to work ourselves out of a job. Unfortunately, there appears to be a lot of job security these days for behavioral health workers. Um, you know, the, the need isn't diminishing. I think as we address issues around stigma, it's okay to get treatment. You know, for, for depression, for somebody with, with you know, a, a minor depressive episode, you know, you're looking at probably six to 12 sessions of care and then people are gone. When we do a really good job, people just go away. We just don't hear from them again. Every once in a while, you know, I got a, a suggestion box comment the other day that actually, you know, said what an amazing difference PBH made in this individual's life. And, you know, the, that happens occasionally. But most of the time when we do a really good job, people just go out and start living their lives. You know, nobody wants to hang out at the mental health center forever, right? I mean, well, I do, but, <laughs> but, I, but I'm a rare breed, but, you know, if we're doing a really good job, people, you know, they get back to work, they get to school, they don't have time to keep coming to the, to their therapy appointments. And then they go out and they live their life. And then if they hit a stumbling block on the way, then they come in for a tune-up, just like you do. If you're, you know, if you are get on heart medication, because you've had hypertension, high blood pressure, you know, you just go about your business and you check in occasionally. And if, if your heart rate starts getting weird or your blood pressure starts getting weird, you go to the doctor for a tune-up and they check you out. They check in with you a few times and then they send you back on the way. And that's really what care is like for most of our folks. Um, you know, again, we have some people who have been with us for a really long time and will be with us for a long time because of the nature of the illness. But those are, those are the exceptional cases. Those are the rare exceptions. Most people will pass through gather the skills, get the support they need to get through a tough patch in life and then move on. We've all been there. You know, when grandma Joan died, we all felt, felt horrific for two days or a week or two weeks. And, and then we learned the skills to manage that and it goes into the background and then we go about our lives. Some people get stuck there for a little bit longer and need a little bit of help getting out of that hole. Um, and we're there for those folks as well as those folks who, you know, are responding to hearing voices and seeing things that aren't there and, you know, just are disconnected from reality. So we see people in the whole spectrum. And one of the very cool things with our federal grant or CCBHC grant 
is we actually brought in some advanced training, clinical training for our staff this year that we hadn't been able to previously afford. So we're doing um, EMDR, which is an evidence-based treatment for people with serious trauma that's been really effective. Again, we brought in this bravado treatment, which is for treatment-resistant depression. And I was walking through the hall and um, I heard laughter coming out of this office. And I thought, what are they doing in there? I thought, oh, maybe it's a birthday party or something. And I went in and it was a bunch of our medical staff. And I said, what are you guys doing? What's going on? And this woman sits up from this chair. I couldn't see her because they were all, you know, blocking. And she said, I just finished my spravato treatment and it's changed my life. She said, I've been depressed for 30 years, 30 years. And I've not felt good one day in 30 years. And this treatment has been like night and day difference over the last month. And it, for the first time in my adult life, I'm not depressed. And we've had about a 67% full remission of depression um, with this treatment, which is just amazing for people who have had all the psychotherapy in the world and all the different antidepressants in the world. And so, you know, we've, we've had an opportunity to do some really fantastic work, bringing primary care in, we're addressing health issues and health disparities of folks who, who've maybe never been to a primary care doctor or haven't been in their adult life. We found breast cancer and skin cancer and three cases of hepatitis C that had previously been untreated because some of our patients won't go into the primary care clinic, but they're willing to see that provider here. So we're doing some really great stuff and we can't do it without the support of the community. And we try to be responsive. We've provided some training to community members on crisis de-escalation and mental health first aid. And so if, if folks are interested in that as well, um, you know, resources permitting, sometimes we can help connect people with some of that additional support in the community. Wow. There's a little bit going on. Just a little oh. bit, Lynn. Wendy and Rebecca, the predictions were correct. A, an hour is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there are any final, I'm checking the, the um, chat to see if there are any Quick questions, because I, I know I have one, but I want to give give the other people an opportunity to ask questions if you'd like. Great, well, I would, I wonder if we can sort of lean into your content expertise a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking about that um, graph that you showed about where we are over the last three years, you know, comparing the three years. And um, I, I feel like, you know, we're in a period of transition. Um, yeah, there we go. We're in a period of this transition. It's probably good. We're, we talked a little bit about that. We're coming back into our beloved community. It's still a transition and we're transitioning into work, into the, the workplaces changing. Any, any tips, any tricks, any words of wisdom for this kind of period of transition? Take care of yourself. A very strange time. Take care of yourself. Take it slow. You know, get outside every single day, even if it's for 10 minutes, especially when it's sunny. Because when you get out in the sunlight, the sunlight hits your retina and your brain releases serotonin, which is what's in all those antidepressant drugs and it makes you feel better. Take the time to connect reach out to somebody that you care about that you know is feeling lonely. You know, a note card in the mail does an amazing amount for people's mood when they get that. Um, you know, think of yourself, but also think of others and just, you know, take it slow. Enjoy being with others, but also give yourself space. You know, you, you see really interesting psychological dynamics happening right now at um, Walmart and Costco with masking versus not masking. And I think you've just got to work within your own comfort level and work with your employees and your employers about what does that look like in your workplace and how do you make it, you know, how do you make that transition smooth? Because there is, I'll, I'll tell you, we're one of the only behavioral health providers I'm aware of that is not, did not send their workforce home to do entirely telehealth. And it is, it is really challenging as people are coming back into the office and, and living within that structure and expectations and they have to get up earlier. And so take it slow, be thoughtful, be kind to others. You know, we'll get on the squim bandwagon and say, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Um, there's, you get a lot out of kindness and, you know, 
give, give people some grace. If people are having a hard time, if people are snippy, you know, recognize that there's other stuff going on that you're not seeing in that person's life and give them, you know, give them a little bit of, of space and grace. Now, there's no rocket science, Lynn. It's, it's one day at a time. And the other thing I will say is you can do anything for one day at a time. Yeah. I, I have two beautiful children and, and during child labor, I learned that you can do anything for five minutes at a time. And so, you know, you, you can expand on that and, and take life in, in what feels like bite-sized pieces. Great. Well said. Thank you very much. Thank you again to you both. I feel like our community yeah. is in good hands. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. All right. See Bye, you everybody has a great day.